That was The Harvest, a classic, classic urban legend, probably the most known, the one we all heard as kids. And I'm here with the incredible, talented director, Jason LaPere. Jason, pleasure, man. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thanks, Eli. So uh, I love what you do with the room here. It's beautiful, beautiful decoration. Yeah, it got a little messy in here, but uh, we're going to make the best of it. A little bit. So tell me, like, you're doing The Harvest, which is probably the best known urban legend. And, you know, it's, it's one that's been told before, it's been filmed before. It's also one of my favorite stories because you still hear stories about it happening in different places. Was this an urban legend you grew up with? I think everyone knows this urban legend, right? Like, it's pretty universal. It happens in every culture. There's some variation of it. I had heard that, of course, and believed it was real, and probably until the internet, you know? When I started researching it and started digging into it, it got pretty funny pretty fast how insanely unrealistic it actually is. Like, someone uh, online had actually done, like, okay, let's say this actually was going to happen. In order to do a kidney surgery, the bare minimum number of technicians involved is like six or seven people who would all have to violate the Hippocratic Oath <laughs> right. in order to do it. It's not actually realistically possible. And then the other thing that I thought was really funny about it is that one of the consistent components of the legend in all its variations is that the victim wakes up in a tub of ice. That's always, always, that was it, the bathtub that's always full a of funny ice. Thing. I laughed out loud when uh, I realized that th that's actually a result of the broken telephone of an urban legend. It's not the victim that has to be on ice. It's the kidney. <laughs> so in of the course. telling, it's evolved into this thing where the guy wakes up in a tub of ice. So I sort of made this creative decision in the telling of our version that we're not going to have him wake up in a tub of ice. We're going to have a tub of ice next to the hotel room. And, you know, the kidney is on ice throughout the episode. But I thought I would take this opportunity to correct the urban legend. Well, to ground it a little bit, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I think one of the things we're trying to do is make these scarier by bringing them as close to reality as we can, right? Like, that's going to make it yes. scarier. The more realistic that the episode could be, the more closer to actual possibility, I thought it would be a little more effective for the audience. That's so interesting, because I'm sure a lot of people would be like, they missed the part about the tub of ice. Yeah. But of course, I mean, yeah, you could wake up in a bathtub full of ice. What to, like, they take your kidney and now they want your swelling to go down? Like, <laughs> no, they're that conscientious. It, it was to definitely fill a tub with ice and put you in it, and you wouldn't notice that after So you die of minutes. hypothermia? I know. Yeah. It's, 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 like, it's another what? really funny part of the, the original urban legend is like, these people were vicious enough to take your kidney out in an illegal surgery, but they want to make sure you're OK. They want to make sure you're recovered. The yeah. recovery has to go well. So <laughs> the you can, has to so go well. You can <laughs> tell the legend to other people. Yeah. What excited you about directing this particular tale? When I first heard about the episode and I started thinking about it, started digging into it, what I really started to think about was what anxiety does this urban legend express? And for me, I decided it was about loss of control. I think there's a reason why it's always a story about a man who loses consciousness and wakes up with a piece of himself missing. I thought that was like a great starting point for a story about uh, slowly losing all control. The other thing I got really excited about when I started zeroing in on that as like the heart of the story was uh, thinking about film noir, which is one of my favorite genres. Mm -hmm. And my favorite film noirs are the ones that spin the most out of control, where the protagonist really starts to uh, have like a psychological breakdown mm -hmm. and is just by the end of the story struggling to hold on. I like movies where it almost starts to feel like you're inside the head of the protagonist. And it's mm -hmm. like, are the things that are happening actually happening? Or is this some sort of like surreal heightened uh, perception that the protagonist is having, you know? So we looked throughout the episode for little surreal touches that we could do, like those portraits of the kids in the background. Anna and Jack are going to be traumatized. You hear me? Over and over again throughout the episode, you'll see point of view shots sort of slide in and out of focus. The protagonist is slowly losing control. Claire, we're over here. It's getting a little blurry, Claire. Double, Double vision. vision. When you want to take that chance? Because you're a very experienced director. Do you still shot list, storyboard? You know, these 
shows that we're doing shoot very fast and on a low budget, but you never feel that watching your work. It, it has such an elegance. I was just curious about your process as a director approaching material. Thank you, yeah. No, I mean, uh, preparation is key. It's crucial. But at the same time, I don't want to prepare to the point where it's calcified, you know? Like, I don't want to just yeah. be shooting a comic book. I mean, assume you're a fan of body horror. Oh, yeah, big Being time. Canadian, you must have grown up with Cronenberg. Cronenberg's the man. What was the first Cronenberg film that got you so intensely excited to either make movies or really freaked you out? The Fly, like no question, right? Like The Fly is yeah. a waking nightmare. And, and, and any film that can make me feel like I'm <laughs> experiencing a waking nightmare is just instantly in my, you know, all-time Hall of Fame. I think it's a great lesson in how prosthetic effects are like a crucial, important part of horror, but you need an incredible performance behind them yes. in order to sell the prosthetic effects. One of your most powerful tools as a filmmaker is the audience's imagination. And the less you show them, the better. If you just give them like eight frames of a prosthetic effect and cut to a great reaction shot, then you're, the world is your oyster. That's another reason I was really excited about this episode. I think our uh, central protagonist, Adam Fawns, knocked it out of the park with his performance. And you know as well as I do that when you're selling a prosthetic effect, it's not the prosthetic effect, it's cutting back to the actor's face to sell the prosthetic Absolutely. effect. Absolutely. I can tell you're excited about the fly because you're doing the Jeff Goldblum. Ah, uh, <laughs> look at me. Let's go. I'm gonna I'm gonna vomit over my hand in a second. Uh, I'm, I'm working on something that'll change the world. Sorry, I throw my Goldblum impression. If you think about all those movies from the 80s that, that are the pinnacle of pra uh, practical effects, like American Werewolf in London and The Thing and The Fly, they're all anchored by incredible performances. It's not a coincidence. And there is that thing of, um, you know, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre where the girl gets hung oh in the meat God. hook and people swear they remember seeing the hook going through That's her right. stomach. You That's know? right. The gore has to be just enough that you're like covering your eyes and the sound, but if you, it's like if you don't give them enough, people get frustrated or you yeah. deliver it in a way they're not expecting. Part of the problem is that we love the Right, so we yeah. always want more, 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 more. But there is a fine line, like you say. It's like you can pull it back to a point where uh, they are doing the work in their head and imagining a hook going through a chest. I'm a big urban legend nerd because I grew up in Massachusetts in the 80s when that was all we did was tell urban legends. And I know that this one had been done to death, losing control of your body, these things that are ours. The idea that you're not donating it to save someone's life, it's willfully being taken from you. Just seeing that story actualized was something that was really important to me. It's the urban legend that is the most known, but I wanted to see it done, and I absolutely love the way you did it. One of the reasons we thought it was important to put a real twist on it, because it was so common, we wanted to throw a few curveballs at the audience. Well, what if someone stole his kidney and he only had one kidney? It's a great twist. So that was a great twist. And then the other idea, and this really speaks to the urban legend nature of uh, the story, is the idea that a wife did this to her ex-husband as revenge is based on a true story. There is a woman in the States, as part of a divorce settlement, demanded her kidney back from her husband that she had donated to him. And the court did not agree. Yeah, we, we, wow. when we wrote it, we thought, well, what if they did? All right, so for people that are watching The Harvest and learning about you and your work, what are some other work of yours that they can check out and where can they find you? My first feature is a film called Cold-Blooded, yeah. uh, which is very much like The Harvest, a fusion of two different genres. It's a crime movie and a horror movie. The movie that I'm most proud of is a movie called I Declare War. Amazing. Where can people like dig deeper to find Absolutely. you and reach Jason out to you?